All right, everybody ready? All right. So my official name is Dr. Sasha Blaskovich. Uh, most patients can't say my last name, so they just call me Dr. B. Uh, my specialty is whiplash and concussion. And it's my specialty because that's what I suffered 27 years ago and have been having problems with ever since. And so I decided to try to learn as much as possible about it uh, to be able to help myself. But it turns out that it also um, has been able to help other people as well. Any, anybody in here ever had a whiplash or a concussion that they know of? Hands up if you had a whiplash or a concussion, whether it's a car accident, skiing, football. Anybody still have symptoms from it? Or are you all healed up? All right, so what I'd like to actually do, because I think your uh, particular uh, discipline in healthcare is probably the best, if not one of the best disciplines to address patients who have had whiplash and or concussion that continue to have problems chronically and even in the acute stages. So what I want to um, do is basically explain something that I don't think was uh, emphasized enough when I went through school and I don't think it's emphasized at all in practice. Um, so I'd like to basically review that with you and it's basically the notion of injury causing ligament damage which is a permanent deformity in fibrous connective tissue resulting in permanent and recurrent instability or hypermobility and how the nervous system and the muscles react to that hypermobility or instability and then especially how that relates to the spine and especially how that relates to the upper cervical spine which is where this concussion whiplash phenomenon is grossly overlooked in medical practice and there's a lot of patients out there that are basically not getting properly helped or assisted because of the fact that this is getting missed and this is getting missed because i don't think it's taught well and i know for a fact that in some places it's not taught at all because as chiropractors as massage therapists as physiotherapists there's a lot of emphasis put on range of motion so as the range of motion being a grade of benefit to care or lack of benefit to care but when you look at the phenomenon of instability after a permanent ligament damage a good range of motion is actually a bad thing does that make sense whereas normally you'd expect to have a good range of motion be what healthy people have and asymptomatic people have but there are more than enough people as examples that i've seen as patients who have a phenomenal range of motion but they're constantly symptomatic so when you have the normal situation of, and if I can go over here, maybe you can still see me. Can everybody see this? So I tr basically drew a, for simplicity purposes, just any in general spinal vertebra, two of them, disc in between. So vertebrae, disc in between, vertebrae, disc in between, vertebrae, disc in between. And what's on the outside of the disc here that I've drawn are just makeshift ligaments, one on the right, one on the left. And then makeshift muscles, one on the right, one on the left. Now, these muscles that span between one bone and the next bone are basically involuntary core muscles that respond to stretch and positioning. They have no, you have no ability to voluntarily contract these muscles. They are reactive and responsive involuntarily. <clears throat> this would be the normal situation. So this is normal. So we've got a bone, a vertebra, another vertebra. There's a disc in between with a nucleus without any movement. So this is a neutral position. This ligament here is partially lax. This ligament here is partially lax. This muscle is relaxed with some level of tone. Do you all understand, understand the term of tone? So tone basically is the resting tension of any muscle in our body. If we didn't have tone in our muscles, so this is without actually physically contracting. If we didn't have tone in our muscles, we'd literally fall over like a bag of fluid. So the tone is what predicates our muscle's ability to basically perceive and respond to something. So when a muscle is hypotonic, so it could basically be paralyzed, or hypertonic, like somebody who's had a stroke and there's a constant neurological bombardment or lack of in inhibition of the bombardment, so they end up being spastically paralyzed, right? So we got the flaccid paralysis and spastic paralysis. Those are the two ends of the spectrum. So these muscles are, sorry, these muscles in the neutral position are not really engaged, but they have some level of resting tone. 
or tension, okay? So they're prepared. When you have movement, so this vertebra is then moving to the left, and this one is moving relatively to the right, what ends up happening is the disc gets slightly warped. The outside fibers of the disc get angled. This ligament on this side and this ligament on the other side, they both become tense. So they get basically elongated to a particular position and they're supposed to stop. And what they do is they stop the motion between these two bones. In the neutral position, like I said, these ligaments are partially lax. They're prepared to allow for some movement in either direction. And when that movement reaches its maximum allowed, due to the healthy length of the ligament, this motion stops. So it's a passive stop of the motion. And these muscles have not undergone any stretch that would force them to contract. Does that make sense? Now, when if I go this way, so we've got the normal situation again. We experience an injury here, whether it's a whiplash or a concussion. Both of them require momentum, and momentum requires deceleration. So things need to be slowed down. And what slows things down when we have momentum injuries are either ligaments passively or muscles actively. And muscles can either be engaged by you going, oh crap, and holding onto the steering wheel, or when they get stretched, they'll respond. Unfortunately, when you experience a trauma like a car crash that you're not expecting to experience, the response time of any given muscle in a normal human being is three tenths of one second. But the amount of time it takes for a car crash to reach its peak acceleration, which is when the movement is maximized, is one tenth of a second. So that means by the time your muscles have responded to try to protect the ligaments from ripping, they're two tenths of a second too late. And this is why people sustain permanent ligament injuries and result in a chronic pattern of requiring treatment. And so this is one of the things when people have been in car crashes, uh, I see a lot of practitioners, massage, chiro, physio, they'll basically do the allotted number of treatments for a patient and then basically release them saying, well, I did my best. They're not fixed or maybe they feel a little bit better and they feel good about themselves and the patient gets released. However, that patient starts to seek other therapies because they're not better. And the reason they're not better is because they've sustained permanent ligament damage, which results in, and I'm going to explain this in a second, which results in a permanent um, accentuation of the tone of these muscles that causes them to always stiffen up and always have soreness and, and ache in a particular area. Because if it was just general overuse, they'd have hypertonicity everywhere. But most of these people have specific areas where they're hypertonic and not hypertonic in the sense they've had a stroke, but just this um, phenomenon where it basically becomes sensitized due to the phenomenon I'm going to explain to you in a second here. So again, we have normal, we have trauma and injury. What ends up happening then the normal situation here is that the disc is slightly bulged out. These ligaments here on the outskirts are slightly stretched out. So they're no longer this length. They're this length plus a factor of X. So let's say this length here was two centimeters and here now they're 2.5 centimeters. So five millimeters of stretch in the ligament that it's never going to recoil back to that two centimeters and then heal. So any healing that happens in this phenomenon here is by way of scarring, but in the elongated position. So if you've ever seen a piece of baking paper or wax paper or parchment paper and you stretch it out, if it doesn't rip, there are parts in there that are weaker and they'll actually stretch out and become more transparent and bubble. Have you all seen that, whoever's baked here? So that bubbly area is literally the same thing as a ligament. So that parchment paper was maybe 15 centimeters long when you've stretched it out. Now it's 15.4 centimeters long. And so this, and it's never gonna recoil back. And the same thing with ligaments. So now when this phenomenon, so say somebody's got a desk job, their head's hanging forward, they have anterior head carriage. This vertebra is gonna shift this way and the other one the other way. And then what ends up happening is this disc is still warped as you see here, this tension point here happens five millimeters later than it did over here. So because it's happening five millimeters later, all of a sudden where the tendon attaches to the bone, so you've heard of the Golgi tendon apparatus. So that sends a signal into the spinal cord. The spinal cord responds by sending an alpha motor neuron uh, efferent response to the muscle itself. The muscle contracts to try to bring this back to that two, two centimeters, because that's normal. That's expected. 
This muscle then relaxes when it's accomplished that two centimeter pullback or that five millimeter pullback to two centimeters. And then if the person's head is still in that position, because this ligament tightens up at 2.5 millimeter, 2.5 centimeters, it's gonna drag that five millimeters again, sending again a stretch reflex in through here and back down to contract. This becomes a perpetual cycle, involuntary. And as that continues to happen more, all of a sudden there's a, something else in these muscles called the muscle spindle. And the muscle spindles measure stretch, but they also measure velocity. So the stretch in a particular direction and how fast it's happening. So then the muscle spindles start to send information to the central nervous system. So this is supposed to be the guy's head and brain. <laughs> and in there, it sends a gamma motor neuron re response back to that muscle, which changes its tone. So it's resting level of tension changes. And as this perpetual cycle happens, in order to give these guys a break, this entire muscle alters its tone so that this gets governed at two centimeters and it doesn't allow that five millimeters to go. But any muscle that has reached that state is basically in a living state of rigor. So basically the cross bridges have locked down. There's tons of lactic acid built up in the area and it's painful. And the range of motion is limited because there's no given this. It's a rigid muscle now. So you can try to override that. And you know, my colleagues do that often trying to you know, manipulate through that. And it occasionally flares people up. And the reason it flares people up is that you may get the crack or the cavitation, but now you're actually forcing a stretch into this muscle that is locked down to protect. Does that make sense? And because it's locked down to protect, it needs muscle work. And I found, and I'll explain why I found that acupressure or sustained pressure techniques and the number one technique that I use, uh, and I don't adjust people very much at all, chiropractically. The number one technique I use is called NIMO receptor tonus technique. And it basically, if you boil it down to the simplest definition of it, it's acupressure, okay? Sustained pressure, which forces the lactic acid out of the muscle fibers, but the pressure itself causes a release of those bridges if it's held, held long enough. And long enough, in my experience, is 20 seconds. And I'll hold sometimes people's trigger points uh, for literally a minute. Um, and when that release happens and the lactic acid is squeezed out and the lactic acid is held squeezed out so the lymphatic system can actually scavenge it, pick it up and remove it. And then when I release that spot, basically it's caused a reset in this neuromuscular system. And so now this muscle can then again be responsive. So this muscle never got weak, it got rigid. Okay, so muscle strengthening exercises to one of these muscles when they've reached their rigid, rigid state to basically protect this whole phenomenon from happening are not amenable to exercise. They're not amenable to stretch. And this is why if any of you have known anybody who's eventually had injury and eventually gone for active rehab and whatever else, and they've done stretching and they've done exercising, they've generally been flared up. And especially as it pertains to the upper neck, that flare up often includes nausea, dizziness, uh, ringing in the ears, balance issues, visual changes, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to sound, all concussive like symptoms. And the reason that that is, is that upper cervical spine, so C1 and C2, they're supposed to govern the position of your head at any given time. And there's, you've heard of the suboccipital muscles, I hope. So those four suboccipital muscles are the most richly innervated with spindles. And the reason that is, is they're supposed to protect the position of your head all the time. And there's even something called a cervical ocular reflex. Have you heard of that? So there's a cervical ocular reflex where there's an actual connection between your eyes and the suboccipital muscles. If you look at somebody slow motion and you film them slow motion, you say, I want you to turn your head to the left. The first thing that happens is their eyes track, and then their head follows. And because their eyes track, and the brain thinks the head's going to follow, the suboccipital muscles engage to try to neutralize that rotation movement. And so if someone's got a desk job and they're just tracking all day long, they're literally working out their suboccipital muscles. And if their suboccipital muscles are already fried because they're trying to stabilize instability from an injury, it's going to be an override of symptoms. That makes sense? Am I going too fast? Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Yeah. So I'll probably do two or three passes. Yeah. Um, you know what? I don't check the range of motion because I think, like I said, I think it's a very uh, awful um, measure of improvement 
because these people will generally have um, a skewed range of motion when they're locked down and a skewed one when they're better. So my preference is to utilize prior to, and I can, if you want to later on break up into doing this actually uh, um, hands-on, we can do that. But I, I prefer resisted ranges of motion in neutral. So by resisted ranges of motion, I basically mean an isometric contraction. So patients sitting on the table in front of me, I'll have them push their head into my forehead, into my hand. And it's the point of release that is important to me. So not whether they have pain during pushing or feel something weird, but at release. And the at release is the thing that tells me that their involuntary muscles are either properly responding or improperly responding or not responding at all. Because at the moment of release is when that reflex neuromuscular connection and response system should basically govern the vertebrae back into neutral without overshooting one way or overshooting the other way. Because when they engage, you basically jam the two vertebrae together and then when they release, it's supposed to kind of bounce back to neutral. But if those muscles are non-responsive because they've undergone lockdown, it's going to either not even get to neutral or bypass neutral and then catch up and come back. And they'll experience that either as a, a shot of pain or they'll get lightheaded or something will happen that will tell you, okay, that isn't normal. And so after I've treated them, then I can repeat that. And almost 10 times out of 10, if they had prior to the treatment, some sensation of abnormality upon release when I do the isometric testing, that will be gone. Plus they'll feel stronger. And we've done nothing to strengthen their muscles. All we've done is made the muscles responsive again. I've never met a patient who's had these injuries who actually has weak muscles. They have either inhibited muscles or non-responsive muscles due to this phenomenon. And by doing acupressure, you can temporarily reset them so they're responsive and active. But because they're then put back into a cycle of stretch, contract, stretch, contract, stretch, contract, tell the brain, the brain brings down the spindles and changes the tone, that refractory period will be guaranteed that they will get worse again. And the reason they get worse is because of the whole phenomenon of these ligaments. That's the number one issue with traumatic um, causes for chronic pain is that they've damaged ligaments. Okay, so because I keep constantly over and over the ligament never gets better. It gets better in the sense that it can scar up and heal, but it always does it in the elongated version of itself. So this cycle keeps happening. It keeps, I've, I've been having it for 27 years, so yes. And I have multiple patients that have had it for years as well to decades. The options, if you want to know the options that people pursue, prolotherapy, so injectables that are supposed to scar up the connective tissue. But again, that does nothing to the change in length. So I've seen lots of people go through prolotherapy. And although I think prolotherapy is valuable, I've never seen it work magic. And it's not because it doesn't work magic, because it possibly and probably does. I've just never seen that with any of my personal patients. Oh, and then there's stem cells. And then there's PRP. Um, those are the three main ones. And at the end of the day, if somebody's symptoms, especially their neurologic symptoms, not so much headaches, and neck pain, but if they're you know not able to hold their bowel and bladder properly, if they're constantly having heart palpitations, acid reflux, balance issues, not able to be upright with you know for any significant amount of time and having to be recumbent, um, those people have been eventually end up needing fusion fusion surgery. So the neurosurgeon that's uh, good at doing this will use their vertebrae so that now there's no more mobility at all. And so that takes care of the problem for that spot. But as we've probably learned. Is that when you stabilize one spot or, or immobilize one spot, something above it starts to become more unstable or hypermobile than something below it because you alter the mechanics of the whole region. So only when it's extremely necessary where it's literally not necessarily life or death, but a person going through life with that many symptoms is completely useless to themselves and everybody else, that this gets considered as, as a surgical uh, option. There was another question back there. Yeah, is that only after the whole from the Anywhere. 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 Because we have this kind of technique in the wrist, so you put pressure on it and then you stretch the... Yeah, so ART basically. Okay. So Nimmo receptor tonus. Yeah. So Dr. Nimmo was a chiropractor in the 1930s who actually devised and, and did the science behind acupressure. And he called the Nimmo receptor tonus because you've got these receptors in here and there's an alteration in tone and that's why he named it that. And, and ART, I think in the 80s, used all the principles of Dr. Nimmo 
and made a pin and stretch version of it. So this one is the opposite. So we pressure and then uh, uh, contract the muscles. Uh, no, I, a, uh, most most of the time when I do um, Nimo, I will actually put the muscle in a ten, in, a, in a tensile position. So in a partial stretch position when I do the Nimo. Because ART puts it in its approximated position and then pins it and then stretches it, right? So it's technically the opposite. But there's no motion in Nimo usually. It's literally just either the patient's neutral or with the cervical spine, I prefer to have it rotated because that uses the bony interlocking mechanism of the vertebrae. So if they do have instability from neutral, putting pressure will actually sh shear the vertebra. But when you rotate the whole cervical spine, the, the facets interlock so that when you pro provide pressure, there is no shear or minimal shear. And this is also when you're doing effleurage and petrissage on someone's cervical spine and they're telling you that after you've done it, they feel lightheaded. It's because that continuous motion, if they have instability and you're going from neutral, it'll cause a repetitive shear. They won't feel it as pain because the spinal cord and the, and the brainstem don't feel pain, but they feel and sense tactile um, compression. And then that elicits spontaneous neurological uh, symptoms. Anyone else? And how they're the most innervated with muscle fibers. And I didn't catch what like, the implications of that could be. When you have a concussion or whiplash, um, nine times out of 10, if, from what I've seen clinically, people have damage to the ligaments in their upper cervical spine, which makes their head technically unstable on their neck. And so the suboccipital muscles, the reason they're most richly innervated is when something like that, like that happens, because the head is literally the thing that you want to protect the most logically because it houses the computer, um, those spindles do a bang up job for the time that they can in stabilizing the head on the neck. And the obliquus capitis inferior has roughly, I think, 220, give or take, muscle spindles per, muscle spindles per volume of muscle. And if you compare that to uh, another, like say the splenius or something like that, maybe has 80. No, I'm not saying that at all. I think that uh, where you do it is, so the suboccipital region, so the upper cervical region, um, I think that the ART, especially when there's the person's having concussive-like symptoms, so neurological things like, you know, they talk about dizziness, they maybe talk about nausea, they maybe talk about, you know, vision, uh, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, heart palpitations, digestive issues. You can assume in some of those cases, the reason they have that is not because all those different systems are failing, but because there's some central compression on the lower part of their brainstem, the medulla, that is causing all these manifestations because the medulla controls all those different things. So it's really difficult for somebody to have problems and all those different things that are actually being caused by those things versus the control or the re relay system in the brainstem that governs all those areas. So that's the only part of the, of the spine that I would personally refrain from using any motion um, muscle tissue work, but everywhere, like mid cervical spine, lower cervical spine, again, paying attention to if they tell you that, you know, if they come back and tell you, you know, after last time I felt great, but then a day later I was lightheaded for a week. That's telling you that likely that um, petrissage that you were doing and that repeated motion was shearing the vertebrae and was lightly bumping up against their brainstem, which caused basically a skewing of the neurological work, workmanship in the spinal cord because there's a refractory period. And when you hit your funny bone, you feel the zinger for a little bit of time. When that happens centrally, so the spinal cord, it's much longer before it comes back to neutral and a baseline. Any other questions? Does this, does this make sense? Did you touch upon any of this stuff through your, through your education yet? So I find, um, like I was saying, that chiropractic, massage, physiotherapy, we're so focused on improving motion, like everything is locked. And we work under the presumption that things are locked because they're locked and not because that sensation of being locked and reduced motion is coming as a result of protecting something else that actually is the opposite of being locked. Does that make sense? <laughs> Deer in headlights. <laughs> um, that's pretty much, I mean, I wanted to discuss that because I think, like I said, your, your profession uh, by and far, I think has the best capacity and I have multiple 
massage therapists that come to me for treatment for their concussive like issues. Um, and a lot of them have started implementing on their own patients, this NIMO. And it's been very um, gratifying for them as a practitioner to start utilizing that on the cervical spine, the upper cervical spine. Um, and I utilize it also on the jaw. So TMJ, uh, pterygoids, uh, masseter, uh, digastrics, um, and also the SCM. So I find the big ones to work on with people who have had uh, whiplash concussion issues and are chronic are the SCMs, then the suboccipitals, and the jaw musculature.